do to change that. Uh, and here we're suggesting increased survival of the winter run juvenile smolt through the delta by 30 percent within 10 years of implementation. So that can be your interim objective. Now this is, that's just for one, that's just for one assumed stressor, but we'll run this one to ground. And so then there are multiple conservation measures uh, that you could implement to make this desired change. Uh, one of them could be the Yolo Bypass uh, and notching Fremont Weir, which I know is one of your favorites. Um, two is uh, uh, real-time adjustments to operations based on much better salmon data. And three could be targeted predator, predator control. Uh, I think we're going we're gonna to jump on here to the, um, uh, we're going to try one of these conservation measures. And uh, so we're going to try one here that's in, um, YOLO bypass. And so here, at this point, this is when models really become useful. So a lot of the modeling you heard about in terms of ecological models, people say, hey, if we notch the weir and inundate the YOLO bypass, it's going to create more fish. And that's our, that's our projected outcome. It's going to do all these good things we want, want to happen. Um, but you actually need to measure and find out what the real outcome is. And you need, to, you need to actually identify what are the metrics by which you're going to measure it. And so here we have uh, the uh, tagged fish, uh, that, the percent that use the bypass, so you put them up upstream. And these are things that you can measure the first time you implement it. The first year you have a notch, you can measure whether you're hitting these metrics or not. How many of the fish that you put in the river actually made it into the bypass? How many of the fish that went into the bypass uh, survived and how big did they grow? These are things that you could measure in one year, and if we're wrong on those metrics, then right away we can go back into our do loop and say, this isn't working, we need to redo what we're doing. We don't have to wait 20 years to find out that once again, we haven't met the long-term goal. I don't want to spend any more time on this except to say that this has been reviewed by two science panels uh, that the Delta Stewardship Council convened, or the Delta Science Program helped us convene for the BDCP. And uh, it could be adjusted, it could be adapted, but it's an example of structured decision-making process catered right to our own ecosystem and the, and the Bay Delta problem you have in front of you. If I could go on to the next, back to the other presentation. So, we um, I also the, now moving moving beyond that. I wanted to talk about hydraulic models for floodplain inundation, and to date, most of the hydraulic models have been uh, developed, perhaps by the Corps or DWR, to talking talking about what's happening between the two levees, and so it's hard to evaluate what kind of floodplain restoration you might have if you expanded the levees or you adjusted the levees. So, uh, American Rivers with uh, with uh, a consulting firm New Fields, developed a hydraulic model for the lower San Joaquin River that is free to, uh, available to use, and it's now, it's now in uh, DWR's possession. And this just shows one scenario that we evaluated in the, in the South Delta. You can evaluate many different floodplain restoration scenarios. And uh, just, so you, um, the, the, just so you believe that we actually have a model, I wanted to show some model results because uh, uh, here we go. We're here. We have. Uh, well, let me before I jump into that. Let me say that we when we when we evaluated this expanded floodway, we also evaluated changes in reservoir re -op operations. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but we did use the WEEP model, and we found it to be a very good model for quickly shifting uh, assumptions about how water um, was stored and released. When we evaluated a scenario that. Uh, looked at current rules, and then another scenario that looked at modifying the flood reservation rule cu curves, adding groundwater banking, and, and also adding two weeks of floodplain inundation so that we were specifically trying to get floodplain inundation happening. I'd, I'm not here to share with you all of the results of this analysis, but simply to show you the kind of, um, um, the kind of metrics we developed that we think would be useful for you when you go forward in doing more modeling analysis. So just to, just to prove that we have a hydraulic model, here, here's what it looks like at 5,000 CFS, 10,000 CFS, 15, 20, 25, and here we are at flood stage. This is one scenario. There's many different ways you could try to optimize the amount of floodplain you get for the amount of water released. But what we were able to come up with 
And this is something that's quite novel. It happens to be the subject of uh, a PhD dissertation for Mary Metella at UC Berkeley, is to come up with a curve of how much inundated area you get um, at a certain probability for different scenarios. So each of these four lines is different scenarios that we evaluated, uh, floodway and reservoir reoperation scenarios. And we're able to see that um, uh, one scenario gives us much better inundation frequencies. Uh, it uh, increases the amount of inundated habitat by about threefold for the 50 percent inundation or recurrence interval that happened, the flood that happens once every, once every year on average. And uh, I won't go into a lot of uh, explanation of this except to say that we've written up all of this. It's in our submittal and we think it's a very novel way of getting at how do you actually um, measure how much inundated floodplain habitat you got for the right duration and at a frequency that's useful and meaningful to the species that you care about. Uh, in this case, salmon need uh, inundation of something on the order of once every one or two years. If you improve the amount of floodplain habitat once every 10 years, it's not going to help salmon very much. Lastly, I wanted to close on um, some thoughts about reservoir reoperation. And first of all, I wanted to say that the, the ecological goals of reservoir reoperation and, and changing water rights are to provide flow necessary to sustain, to sustain species, habitats, and ecological processes. And, and our view is that you need to mimic the natural flow regime to the extent practical to sustain these species and habitats and ecological processes. But that unimpaired, and what I want to emphasize here, because I've heard a lot of what I view as misunderstanding about unimpaired flows. Unimpaired flows can provide a guidance on how to shape restoration hydrographs, but unimpaired flows are not necessarily the goal in and of themselves. And if we think very, um, the, the art is to develop scenarios that mimic the natural hydrograph that are not so rigid that they drive the, the reservoirs levels down to, to unsustainable levels. And some of the unimpaired scenarios that we've seen reported on in the last panel, in my view, those are very rigid scenarios. What happens if we demand 60 percent unimpaired or 40 percent unimpaired? Uh, the, the challenge is to be much more creative in the kind of scenarios we develop so that they mimic the natural flow regime, they provide the ecological benefits for the species we care about, and they do it in a way that minimizes disruption to the reservoirs and water supply. So I provided some testimony, written testimony, rather short that explains how you might do this. And it's summarized here that the first step is identifying what our ecological objectives are. Uh, and that, that's challenging. Some people might care more about steelhead. Other people might be more interested in fall run. And you need to, to do some balancing there or some um, uh, at least acknowledge those competing objectives. The next is to identify flow needs to meet those ecological objectives. And here's another step where we can use model output. If we know that the fish need a certain water temperature in the summer, we can look at the water temperature models that have been done and say, you know, we probably need about 300 CFS during these summer months. And that helps us identify the flow needs that fish need during different types of the year. And based on using data and, uh, and, and model results, we can, we can fill out all the determine all the flow needs for the different ecological objectives and convert that into an annual restoration hydrograph. Now, there's different amounts of water in dry years and wet years. So you have a bigger budget to spend in a wet year and a smaller f budget to spend in a dry year. And based on that, you, based on those budgets, you develop different restoration hydrographs for a dry year, uh, an average year, and a wet year. And, and we would say probably five different types of years. And then you model those annual hydrographs um, with, a, with a screening level model, not one that you have to recode. Please, let's do something where you can actually push buttons and have the model run happen real time, at least within 24 hours. Uh, model the annual hydrographs, and it, uh, actually 24 hours might be an exaggeration, but a, a very quick screening run, uh, model run and you, you identify what are those undesirable reservoir impacts and uh, where might we be able to manage them. And then you rerun the model with alternative water manage, management strategies. And this might, these might be several iterations. And again, we need a screening level, uh, we need a model that's good for screening runs. 
not one that you need to recode, where you evaluate different management strategies like efficiencies, transfers, groundwater banking, flood reservation rules. Some of these have already been done um, as described in my testimony for groundwater banking and flood reservation rules. Uh, and you also impose constraints on both irrigation and restoration flows to prevent the reservoir impacts. Instead of just assuming that we have no control over how much water we take out of the reservoir and force to irrigation or force to downstream flows, we can actually set off ramps and say, if we get to a certain spot, we're, we're going to, because we need to balance, we're going to reduce the amount we're taking out of the reservoir this year, we're going to reduce the amount we deliver to farmers, and we're going to reduce the amount we deliver to fish. Um, and so by going through this iterative process, we eventually we adjust the restoration hydrographs and we adjust the water rights to best balance the beneficial uses. That's how we would propose developing scenarios rather than taking overly simpl and simplistic rule of thumbs like 20% unimpaired or 60% unimpaired and trying to force them through a model. John, a, a counterpoint, and you may not like it, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't throw it out. You mentioned the, my request for an interim process and have a goal of, say, 30 percent. I think things like that are going to be, you know, goals that we should have in mind, but probably the best we're going to be able to do is provide water quality and flow components that we feel would enhance the restoration to a quantifiable degree. But because of this fourth model that was off to the right of your slide that didn't get included on things that are beyond our control, I'm not really sure if we can do much more in this process than to try and enhance the environmental condition that would provide optimal increases in restoration because there's going to be some things that are beyond our control and if we stick ourselves with a number while we need to have a goal I'm concerned that we'll just have this ongoing process that will always be in flux because once the habitat and the water quality issues have been resolved to the best of all our abilities and I don't just mean the five of us once we've done our best job there, there's still something, a component that's beyond our control. And I don't, I think it would be naive to think that we would have the luxury if that didn't work to keep throwing more and more and more at it. I think the challenge is to do our best when we come up with these flows in the first place and hope to heck we did it right. I don't, I doubt that you agree with that, but I think, you know, we need to be aware that that's going to have to be part of our goal at the end of the day or we're never going to, it, it, we'll just continually be doing these processes, which I don't think we have the luxury to do. Well, and feel free to disagree with me, but I, I felt, I'm not saying that in a controversial way, I just want to try and give a bit of this a reality check. And if my colleagues disagree with me, they're well, free to well, say something. I, I, I think um, if I'm interpreting your comments correctly, that you're saying that if we set a number we don't know whether that's achievable, and it may be achievable for reasons outside of the control of the water board. Right. And that's understandable. Um, back to the, the objectives that we're talking about setting, and so I'm, I'm using the word objective rather than goal, and the objectives are, we're saying should be smart, specific, measurable, achievable. Okay, so we don't want you to set objectives that are not achievable, and we agree that they should be achievable. Now, uh, I recognize that it may be hard to determine what's achievable at this point in time. We, we think, though, that it's very important that the goal actually be a specific measurable number um, so that when we talk about doing restoration actions, we can ask, will that restoration action get us 10% of our way to that number or 50% of our way to that number? Um, Without n having an actual number, it's very difficult to scale the kind of program you need to actually achieve that number. And keeping in mind that something may happen that's outside of your control that prevents us from achieving these objectives, perhaps it's because we don't know enough about the system. In 10 years, you can come back and say, this objective is not achievable and we're going to change it. But um, if the objective is vague uh, and it doesn't say who should do it, 
or doesn't identify where the finish line is or when the finish line is, we can pretty much bet we're going to be in the same place we are now in 20 years. So in, in the case of BDCP, we've said, please, just set numerical objectives. They don't have to be permit terms. They just have to be something that guides the plan so we can actually evaluate whether we're achieving the plan objectives. And the permit terms could be different than the actual measurable uh, objectives. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hey, um, or, uh, Mr. Kane, I wanted to acknowledge. I, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that you had done the modeling effort because when you were talking in two workshops ago about floodplains in the San Joaquin, I was struggling a little bit. So, I was uh, in terms of the feasibility in the overall discussion. So you actually showed a map and some actual data, and I thought that was responsive to our discussion. What, um, of course, there are a lot of assumptions in this. I've done a lot of restoration work in the Bay Area downstream. Um, what are the land ownership um, implications of, of such a ambitious floodplain restoration project? Well, we're, um, I, I suffice it to say, I, I don't think that what we modeled is something that would be popular locally. Um, <laughs> We were we actually called our study the bookend study. We just wanted to we just wanted to figure out what in the universe could you physically achieve, and then the next step. And we have presented this, and we we wrote a draft that's in our in our submission. We presented it at a couple of workshop at the Calfed uh, or the Delta Science Conference, and also at the UC Davis Watershed Center. And the first thing Jay Lund said about it is, well, we need to we need to figure out how to optimize this, and how can we create more habitat that's inundated more frequently but you're setting back less levees and you're giving up less farmland. And so that's really the next phase of it. And there, there, um, I, I was going to say that there is similar work that's being done in the Yolo Bypass. Uh, one of the graduate student, Jay Lund, or Jeff Mount's graduate student, is doing an optimization analysis for how to balance agricultural land use, waterfowl, and fisheries. And we have a lot of great tools for doing this. So um, but, you know, somebody has to actually think about what what is physically possible and that's what we were looking at and I also like to say that I thought the presentation was cogent and in some ways if if y'all if people were paying attention you were providing an answer to some of the questions that the previous panel posed in terms of specific uh, ecological objectives um, you know I thought it was a very useful product to bring into a form of collaboration in terms of working with fishery agencies and, and uh, DWR, BUREC, et cetera? Well, where I work, we have uh, performance objectives, and I'm going to have a review with my boss, and I'll make sure I'll tell him that I met my objective. <laughs> I hope you have those at where you work. <laughs> so good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Leo Winternitz um, with the Nature Conservancy. I have my colleague, uh, Clint Alexander. He's uh, Cessna Nature Conservancy. He, he is our consultant. He works with ESSA. They're based in Canada. We've been working with them for 12 years on a tool which we call the Ecosystem Flow Tool. And uh, we, it's actually two tools, one for the Delta and one for Sacramento. And we'd like to introduce it to you today in the hopes that you find it useful in your deliberations as you move forward. And other parties, including DWR, the Bureau, and others, find it hopeful as well, or find it useful as well. So in 2001, um, w during the CalFed era, we started developing this, uh, this ecosystem ecological flow tool uh, with support from ecosystem restoration program funds. And uh, that's what's managed to keep us going. It was developed essentially uh, a, as a response to a number of water projects that were being planned along the Sacramento River, um, north of Delta storage projects, as well as uh, water projects in the Delta. We wanted to know in, in a summary manner what the long-term um, and multi-year effects would be on a suite of um, e ecosystem processes and species that we were concerned about would be, and this tool provides us uh, those kinds of um, answers. So our goal really was to develop 
a product that allows for a straightforward and simple yet a comprehensive understanding of the effects of different water management scenarios, uh, particularly flow on both habitats and species. So what this tool does is it takes flow outputs from established physical and hydrological models, it combines that output with established biological models, and then provides what we call, for particular water management scenario, habitat suitability indices for specific species and specific habitats. So, in other words, you tell us uh, what flow levels for the Sacramento River or the Delta you may be interested in, and, and the ecosystem flow tool will tell you how that flow affects a suite of habitats and species in a straightforward but also comprehensive manner over a long period of time. Um, this tool hasn't been developed in a vacuum. There have been uh, dozens of scientists and engineers who have helped us with it over the years. They represent state and federal agencies, consulting firms and research institutions, and they participated in our workshops. And, and, and the, essentially the tool is also based on the papers that they wrote. Um, these are the relationships where the tools have been established. So as you can see uh, in, the, um, in the, uh, the picture before you, I mentioned there are two EFTs, e eco um, ecological flow tools. One is Sacramento. The Sacramento covers essentially from Shasta Dam to Calusa, and the second is the Delta, which covers, which includes the Soon Marsh and the Delta. The SAC EFT, as we call it, has been applied in the north of Delta um, off-stream storage investigations in August 2011. And for pr the preliminary administrative alternatives for the Bay Delta Conservation Plan this last September. We're now moving into a phase uh, for the Delta in particular where we will be able to propose alternative flow regimes um, designed to enhance the, ecolog the uh, ecological integrity of a system. Um, while working within water delivery constraints. And so this will be discussed in more detail by my colleague, Clint Alexander. Thank you. Good uh, afternoon. I will try to make up a bit of time. That clock says 29 minutes, and I think there's still three folks down here, so I'll try to respect that. Um, in terms of the types of management questions we can look at with this tool, which again has been going uh, on since about 2004. It's been funded principally through uh, grants out of uh, the CalFed uh, program at that time. And we've, in Sacramento, this, this is a neat figure that it tries to show you that there's both flow and non-flow actions that, that are considered. So the external box represents climate forcing, uh, human demands, things that are looked at by the hydro system models that you've been hearing about. And in the Sacramento River box, we can look at uh, gravel augmentation, uh, riprap and levee uh, setbacks, some of the types of uh, actions that John was just looking at. And of course, new water storage in the case of sites. Uh, in the delta, it's more about um, conveyance. And uh, in both cases, obviously the operational uh, regime is very important. Um, and when you do those things in terms of operations or conveyance, you get different types of uh, hydrographs. Uh, you can look at those with exceedance plots. You can look at those as time series. And, and there are a bunch of squiggly lines. And it's hard to know ecologically which of those lines might be preferred. Um, we uh, are very much dependent. A, a, a major principle of this system was not to redevelop and reinvent physical models in particular. Uh, this is mostly an ecological modeling uh, tool. So while we can link with any uh, physical model that you might propose, as long as it has daily flows, that's the resolution we, we uh, require, uh, we're currently linked with CalSIM and its daily disaggregation uh, family, uh, SRWQM. Um, and in the Delta, we use DSM-2 and its constituents. And so we plug into those. Um, there's some other models on this figure as well that I'll, I'll skip past for now. And we have our own system that we've created with the functional rules and uh, we suck in all of this data and link it to the locations that matter ecologically. Um, in terms of species that we're representing in the Sacramento ecoregion, steelhead, all the runs of Chinook salmon, green sturgeon, 
bank swallow. Um, we have we really have large woody debris recruitment as a proxy for western pond turtles and Fremont cottonwoods. And we do not have life cycle models for all of these things. We have representative uh, indicators and functional relationships linked to flow, water temperature, and other variables that say something important about one of the life history stages of these various critters. In the case of bank swallows, they, it's things like uh, nesting colonies that need to be um, refreshed after every four or five years or they get an ecoparasitism problem and they become un unusable for nesting birds. So, so they require some channel migration to happen uh, periodically, just as one example. In the delta, some of the same uh, species um, trying to process other aspects of their life history in the delta, steelhead, chinook. Uh, we have delta smelt, split tail, um, tidal wetlands, and we have um, this idea of invasive species deterrence uh, in Delta EFT. And so we have our, our two favorite clams and Brazilian waterweed in there. And like uh, you've seen, um, I'm sure many times, uh, we, uh, we've developed through workshop processes, uh, which is our main form of peer review that's been used. Um, we've taken a look at DREREP. We've taken a look at all sorts of um, of papers and science and we the blue arrows on this diagram represent indicators that we actually have chosen and you can see some black lines there we haven't attempted to represent every possible linkage uh, between the bottom where we have habitat forming processes and all the way up to the actual numbers of, of um, larva and juvenile and adult fish in the case of smelt. Um, you'll Hopefully saw a brochure that was handed out earlier. This will give you a chance to maybe absorb this on your own time later, and we can, that's been submitted for you. Um, there's a lot of documentation. Jay talked about documentation. We have some excellent documentation and some pointers to that in that material, that handout that you have. We have basically 11 species and 24 indicators uh, in, in EFT, 12 in SAC EFT and 12 in uh, Delta EFT, and they're listed here. In the interest of time, I won't go read through that for you. But the idea is that we're trying to pick a representative suite of indicators and look at that as opposed to just our favorite pet species, uh, one at a time. Uh, here's the list for Delta EFT. Um, not developed in a vacuum. We have had approximately 70 scientists working on this since 2004, mostly in workshops. These are folks that we've pilfered things from their scientific papers. The Kimmerer uh, entrain proportional entrainment method, for example, is what our entrainment index is based on for Delta Smelt, for, for instance. Uh, and we're really very grateful to all these people because uh, none of us would have had uh, the insight to develop uh, some of the some of the relationships we have here, and this needs to continue. As you've heard, uh, we need more peer review, especially on Delta EFT. Uh, the the SAC EFT tool is a little older, and it's went from version one to two, and has had uh, a formal peer review workshop, whereas Delta EFT has not thus far. But that's the plan for the the current grant that we're we're operating on in January of 2013. Um, so it's a cumulative effects problem that you have in the delta, and this slide is a little busy. It's kind of a mind mappy thing where it illustrates that it's, uh, there's multiple mechanisms operating in the delta, and the pink things are the kinds of uh, aspects of this problem that we can look at with EFT. We can't, we're not attempting to do everything. Uh, we're not attempting to answer any questions about, for instance, a very important component, food webs and food supply. That's not in our tool. Um, we don't have um, uh, as many water quality elements as we might like to in future versions. So there are some limitations that uh, it has. And you know, in a, a lot of these models that you're hearing about are meant to be used in a weight of evidence framework anyway. And this is, this is just one we hope you might look at. Um, in terms of very high-level summary, summary results, we've applied it to BDCP. I won't take you through all of this other than to illustrate in this legend that I'll put up that the darker burgundy and reds is bad, red is, red is bad. We have a traffic-like paradigm in this tool. And this shows some 
I don't believe these have been, Leo can correct me, but I know that these alternatives in BDCP are not the final ones that are being proposed and I intentionally am showing you the late long term 2060s period. Uh, very strong downward pressure on all of the indicators in Delta EFT with the exception of entrainment risk and YOLO bypass which has that notch in the weir and shows up as a positive signal even under future climate uh, in the case of of um, rearing habitat for Chinook. So that's the percentage of, of about of however many years are in those simulations that had favorable conditions baseline versus some alternatives and that's a way we roll this stuff up which I know the BDCP folks are struggling with and we're, we, work, we work on that. You'll see some slides in a moment where, that show us how, how we do that. Um, I had a cheeky Bill Clinton line about it's the climate stupid, um, but I think that was edited out. But um, climate change is very, very significant to what you need to consider as you develop standards, whether it's ecological or otherwise in the future, and I'm sure you're, you're very well aware of that. Um, and that was one of the, the early messages from this analysis uh, that we've done. The software itself looks like this. This is a screenshot that picks down the left side one, two, three, four, five actually, scenarios. They happen to be BDCP scenarios. And the bo very bottom one is, is actually just historical data, which I'm often told I should never present alongside of action alternatives, but sometimes do because it's a longer time series and it's, it, it provides a historical context. And the red is the number of years for uh, that. Uh, that first indicator is, um, I think it says, you probably can't read it at the back, it says delta smelt habitat suitability and the next one, DS4, is entrainment risk. And it's the number of years that were found to be poor, fair, or good um, in, in the modeling. And on an annual basis, that looks that like that. You can look at individual years to look for patterns in time. And these are our key roll-up tools. And the any given year you can then drill down to daily details or maps. So this is a look at um, a map of a DS4 indicator for entrainment risk and you can see some of the main uh, index locations, green meaning that the risk was low and if I had a live software demo I could hover and show you the, the values of things. And um, I was very impressed this morning by the, the animations you've seen. We have some of those same tools to try to help just communicate what's going on and slicing and dicing through all this stuff. And then you can get all the way down to graphs if you prefer and this is uh, just sticking with entrainment as one of the 24 indicators. The green in the top left is a, is a, is a, a good year, I mean low entrainment and you can see the driving physical data that's behind that and this, the old and middle river flows and these axes are different but on the right side that's zero it's a zero line up top and it's a poor year and this is the Kimmerer predicted um, smelt entrainment um, percentage at a single location, the Turner cut. Um, let's keep trucking here. I'll finish with returning to your questions that I believe you had in your, <laughs> um, your agenda and um, there should be some hopefully some consistency with what John was presenting at the end. What types of analyses should be completed? Uh, we want to, we would recommend looking at um, clear priorities, certainly smart, smart objectives, but clear priorities for all of these many ecological candidate objectives that, that are out there. There's a lot of them. Um, you need to uh, definitely deal with the water year class um, component. And there are non-flow actions and flow actions that work together to make a difference. It's not simply flows. So levy setbacks, notching weirs, changing um, uh, stor storage changes in the north. Th those are all um, important. We need to test alternative ecological flow regimes uh, versus other beneficial uses. And this, this is, as Leo said, where we're at now. It's actually very difficult in, as a, just as a, consultant working in a, in a modeling as a, as a modeler to speak the same language as my you know Tara and Marianne and some of the Chandra and there's some very very gifted hydrodynamicists as I think William Fleener calls them and 
there needs to be more time together um, developing these strategies. Uh, the models I've found physically are quite constrained and to unwind them and rewind them back up again is challenging. Um, making it hard to do some of those tests to rule out, to see options and to rule out ridiculous things and maybe find the win-wins. The I'm going to skip When you say it, uh, it would take time to do that, I mean, what are we, you talking about? Are you talking about years or decades or It'll days? Take, or? It, could take, it could take months if we could get the two disciplines truly engaged on a sustained basis to work together, to not be bound by potentially confidentiality concerns with other clients and those kinds of things which are in, you know behind the scenes slow down speed. I'm going to skip past these next I think these are all very good ideas but I, I'm looking at that clock and I want to see if I can preserve some time for uh, the other folks here. I'll finish with this slide. Uh, the, the advantages of the uh, EFT system are shown here. It's in summary looking at a representative suite of species and habitats um, we've integrated that into one framework so that trade-off evaluation is fast. We can actually do this in days and weeks, not months and years, when we are tasked with effects analysis. Uh, we've linked one to, uh, Sacramento and the Delta that are very Im important <laughs> um, to each other. There's a lot of synthesis of, of evidence that we've done and that also needs to continue. Uh, that has informed what we've got. Uh, there's multiple actions included. Uh, we've had good feedback on, on the traffic light idea and the, and the ability to uh, simplify how we communicate. Um, we're able to plug into to any of the physical models. We're, that's a space we're not trying to recreate and we, we are very excited to work with people that are doing that. Um, and we need to continue to review, improve, uh, the indicators, some of them will probably be found over time to be not that informative in, in decision making and would be removed. This is a little bit cheeky, but uh, I put in here that, that there's a Goldilocks level of detail. Um, we kind of strike for the midpoint of detail. Uh, that means on the limitation column, confess, confessing that we can't give you a definitive assessment of the population level benefits, and we don't try to do that. Can't tell you how many fish it'll make. Um, and you have life cycle models that are working on that, that aspect of the problem. Um, we have the same weaknesses that the physical models have if we're using those models. We, um, y we need to ensure that, that the monitoring adaptive management is paired with this, the tool so it can be refined because we don't have as much data as the, as the engineers and physical sci scientists have when they develop their tools. And it's, it's obviously not a, a real-time decision-making model. I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. I think I'm next. Um, Chris Schutz, water balance modeling. Well, while he's looking for that, I'll try to get started. I'm Chris Schutz, the FERC Projects Director with the uh, California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. They never seem to get protection in the name. Um, in case you haven't found it, my 14-page written testimony is contained at the very back of the board's 300-page PDF of the submittal by CSPA, Seawind, and Aqua Alliance. Um, I'm going to talk strictly about um, water balance modeling today. I've worked in relicensing projects uh, in FERC processes from McLeod to Merced and my experience uh, with water balance models over the last 12 years um, is described at the end of my written testimony. Um, how are we doing? Doesn't look real good.
like the look I get sometimes. <laughs> I didn't get it done. We'll consider this the afternoon break and not take it off the time. <laughs> How's that? Do you need Do you need me to find it give it to you again? Yeah. Thanks. Kim, do you have a presentation without a PowerPoint or are you electronically? I I gave it to you. All right. So I'm going to make five basic points today. I'm going to show them here, and then I'm going to go through them one by one. Uh, the board needs independent modelers. Um, the board is at the intersection of numerous legal policy and technical issues. When you construct a legal or policy scenario, you're going to need to translate that into uh, technically into water balance models or models. Uh, you're going to need feedback in doing that from modelers about how to write rules and assumptions that work in models. And you'll need to answer questions for modeling that you don't think of when you construct a policy or a legal scenario. So we saw earlier that calcium 2 assumes existing water rights rules. But you're probably going to be looking at policy or legal changes that may modify those rules and you're going to have to work with a modeler to go into the model and make changes. Um, if you don't do that, by not making a choice, you'll in fact be making a choice. You'll have priorities that are embedded in a model that will define the, the outcomes of what you, output you get when you run a model scenario. So the take home here is that the board needs to work closely and interactively with modelers. Um, there is no single model that's going to work for your purposes. Um, you have issues of time step, geographic scope, and model purpose. So as one small example, I took a corner of the calcium, um, calcium 2 schematic and um, projected it. And you see the little circle there around the Yuba County Water Agency Yuba River input. Um, that's what calcium does for inputs from the Yuba River. And here is what part of a schematic of part of what's upstream of this mo node here on the um, Yuba River. Now, in aggregate, this is not a huge amount of the percent of the inflow to the delta. But for the folks in Nevada and Placer counties, it's very important because it's most of the water supply for Nevada County and a good part of the water supply for Placer, so when you go to evaluate the impacts, you're going to need to look at what's upstream. And in between this one and calcium, there's still another <coughs> schematic for the Yuba County Water Agency operation. Um, and uh, not only the folks downstream in the valley and, and in, in the projects, but also the folks at Yuba County Water Agency are going to be very interested in, in seeing what, if any, requirements you place on the folks upstream of the, uh, of the rim dams. So the message here is that you need to use upstream models to evaluate impacts and, and operations for different scenarios. Now, one of the good things is that you have a daily time step model. It's been vetted by a large number of um, agency and other um, technical folks. Um, the hydrology is agreed on. And you're not going to have to have the argument about whether it is a, um, 
whether it's technically or hydrologically workable, because we've already done that. Um, you asked earlier, who should assume modeling leadership? My immediate answer is, you should. Um, even if there's a community modeling effort, you're going to need models that suit your needs. Um, we've heard today a number of reasons why calcium 2, for example, can't do a number of things. I'm not going to repeat them. Most of these have come up already today in discussion. Um, but you need to, um, you, you'll also need to look at upstream models um, as well as, as these models, uh, as well as the calcium model. Um, and you have that available to you uh, from many of these hydro processes. Um, if you don't work with modelers and define a model or models um, and a way of working with them that allows you to change the priorities and decisions that are embedded within the model, then the model is going to be making the policy decisions for you. The rules, as, as we saw earlier in the presentation from the Bureau and, and DWR, are there. They are existing rules. Um, you're going to need to understand what the options are for doing that and translate those technically in your water operations models. Finally, um, the assumptions and rules and inputs and outputs need to be systematically developed and, and transparently disclosed. That's obvious. It's something that everybody says, but it's not usually done very well. Um, a lot of times, a lot of things are assumed because you haven't changed anything. But in fact, you're going to need to make changes or define where you haven't made changes. It's kind of like the guy going and asking where directions are. And you'd say, well, you turn right at the first uh, turn over here. But there's a little path off to the right. Well, is that one of the turns or not? You need to say what you didn't do. Um, and in particularly important is that you need to manage the message. We're hearing in a lot of places across the state that um, by implementing some version of the board's delta flow requirements, you're going to drain this reservoir, kill all the fish in this river, and so forth. And part of what transparently and clearly defining the inputs and outputs and variables is will allow you to do will be to help manage that message and say, well, yes, if you assume this and this and this, that might be true. But in fact, it won't be true if we do it differently and, and, and do it in this way that we've outlined right here. So um, I recommend that you look at my written testimony. Um, thank you very much. And um, I tried to keep it short. Thanks. Greetings. I'm Tim Strochane. I'm a senior research associate with the California Water Impact Network. Uh, my presentation is also on behalf of the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance and Aqua Alliance. On behalf of those organizations, my presentation addresses water availability analysis for river basins tributary to the Bay Delta estuary. My presentation is about using the law as an analytic tool. In my talk, I will recap the State Board's 2010 flow determinations and its stated intention to establish a proportional flow regime that would deliver public trust protective inflows from all the watersheds tributary to the Bay Delta estuary. We describe a legal theory by which we believe the Board could legally implement proportional flows. We then present a planning level water availability an analysis to quantify the application of the California Doctrine to proportional flows 
from Bay Delta Estuary watershed tributaries. We present our modeling rationale supporting hydrologic and water rights data and results in our written testimony and its appendices. Finally, I'll briefly identify paths that we see for aligning water rights claims, beneficial uses, and proportional flows to the delta and that we recommend the board build into the Bay Delta Plan's implementation program. <clears throat> In 2009, the legislature directed the State Water Board to develop new flow criteria that directly address the question, what flows do fish and ecosystems of the Delta need? The flow determinations are not merely for preventing jeopardy, as called for under the Endangered Species Act, but also indicate what is needed for recovery purposes under the public trust doctrine. In fulfilling the legislature's direction, the board made two key flow determinations aimed at mimicking the, natural, the tributary's natural hydrographs. 75% of unimpaired in, uh, Sacramento River inflow from November through June, and 60% of unimpaired San Joaquin River un, inflow from February through June. In our analysis, these determinations are assigned regulated periods during which we treat them as if they are flow objectives. The board's flow determinations also included its stated intention that proportional flows will be needed from all the tributaries to the Delta watershed. Our organizations think that the board should apply the California doctrine to determining tributary contributions to proportional delta inflows. Our method translates the components of the California doctrine into the various quantitative elements of water availability analysis needed to prioritize allocations. In this doctrine, you provide public trust protection first to all beneficial uses. <coughs> Riparian water right holders may divert next, constrained by the state constitutional requirement on re for reasonable use. Pre-1914 appropriators may divert to the extent there ex remains a surplus of water available in the river. Finally, to the extent that water is still available after the riparians and pre-1914 claimants have made their diversions, post-1914 permittees and licensees may then divert. The board already uses water availability analysis when it receives new water rights applications on streams that may be fully appropriated. An analogous planning level water availability analysis should be conducted by the board for the Bay Delta Plan. In our analysis, we statistically describe unimpaired hydrologic data for the Bay Delta watershed and we researched water rights claims of the watershed's major tributaries and creeks. We included claims data from pre-1914 notices and data available from the State Water Board's databases, including post-1914 permittees and licensees, statements of diversion and use, and adjudication decrees. I emphasize that our analysis measures claims to water use. By focusing on claims, we call attention to the exaggerated condition of water rights in this watershed. First, there are far more claims to use water than there is water to fulfill them. Second, water rights that have not been adjudicated